The insights of Jay Martin on our world. Society and politics. The Jay Martin interview. Hello, uh, this is the One in Seven stream, and with me is Jay Martin. We're talking about pretty with towels, hostile environment, and also how um, the Brexit situation may have exacerbated the HGV lorry driver shortage. Although. Um, we didn't hear about that before Brexit. But is it all to do with Brexit? It may not actually be. Um, is it as simple as that? And then Pretty Patel, um, the words hostile environment uh, have been associated with, with her as, as uh, Home Secretary, but also her predecessor, Theresa May, had the same term dubbed for some of the policies that she had as well. So what, does, um, what do you think is meant by hostile environment when it comes to, um, you know, immigrants migrants uh well firstly uh hello everyone uh, it's good to be back um and when it comes to the hostile environment well this, this has been a um issue immigration has been an issue in uh, in britain or well, a political issue it's not an issue for uh for me we have a an island nation at the end of the day um you know the, the the notion that immigration somehow stops for, for an island that you know couldn't wait to go and plant flags around the the earth not too long ago. Really, since um, I'd, I'd probably suggest uh, around about the 2000s, certainly with the uh, ascent of various uh, political treaties with the European Union at the time under Tony Blair, so the replacement of Maastricht and then Treaty of Lisbon. And the ascent of a number of Eastern European countries. Um, it, it, when we look at the hostile environment, this really, it, it, its origins to answer the, the question are, uh, are important, so context. So in the mid noughties, um, Poland, um, as well as some Baltic uh, countries, um, uh, joined the European Union. And uh, that would you know, it meant they adopted some countries, the euro, but it meant that they had the ability to travel uh, freely uh, around the European member states. And uh, a lot of people took the opportunity to go and work in other countries whereby, uh, you know, there might be better pay conditions. Um, but like so many Brits, uh, you know, traveling around the world for work and all of the rest of it, it wasn't anything unusual, um, uh, particularly. Um, but by the mid noughties, there was a great sense of unease um, in many places in Britain. And it was sort of two or three fold. We had some issues in, for example, in Oldham, where I uh, used to work uh, around the integration of people, not from Europe, but from um, from Asia, um, families who had British passports issued um, during the uh, British Empire, for example, who had come, come to settle. Um, issues with integration from, from various communities, basically, there wasn't this community cohesion that I think we, 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 we strive for. Further to this, um, right-wing press politicians um, turned the screw no longer upon their, uh, prior to, let's be arbitrary about this in say 2005, but prior to that, uh, where the obsession had been with Indian um, immigrants, uh, first, second, third, fourth generation, those from Africa, those from Ireland, you know, the hostile environments, you know, um, no Irish, no dogs, you know, things like this. There has always been an undercurrent in Britain of some sort of hostile environment, but really our hostile environment today um, began or began to genocide in the likes of Theresa May's um, eyes uh, when she was uh, in opposition under David Cameron opposing the Labour Party. The Conservative Party had decided that they were going to jump on this bandwagon of this anti-Eastern European, too many Poles, too many of this, this and this. And the reality of it, it stuck as an, an election message. There were a number of people who uh, agreed that um, immigration has got out of control. Um, whatever control of immigration actually means, again, as an island country, 
Well, it was it, it was this sort of idea of uh, oh look the, the 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 polls are opening Polish shops. Uh, you know uh, we've got issues in um, um, in the likes of Oldham and Burnley, um, which were reflected in uh, some of the uh, election results, uh, co- local council elections returning BNP and then UKIP uh, councillors. And there was this sort of general attack. I mean, pr- primarily UKIP um, was an anti-European party, but they began to conflate immigration with, you know, um, people who were, uh, for, you know, first, second generation Pakistanis or Indians or whatever it might be with the EU. It didn't matter. In other words, they just didn't like the quote unquote Johnny Foreigner. And with this and with that notion of immigration being poisonous, um, coupled with right wing ranks, you know, the Daily Mail, et cetera, et cetera, we ended up with a Tory government under uh david cameron with theresa may who was at that point seen as this strong and stable um um um, home secretary and she had a number of um pretty revolting policies driving vans around particular places in certainly in london with vans you know, call this number if you suspect someone's an illegal immigrant and, you know, we will send them back. By the time she had become prime minister, of course, we had uh, two very key events. We had the Grenfell fire, which exposed the undercurrents of the real conditions that uh, those in abject poverty and immigration uh, and immigrants, excuse me, face. We also had, of course, the Windrush scandal where People who'd been living in in Britain for, you know, one example of what sixty five years was flown up over to Jamaica and uh, told, "Boy, there you go, back home." Well, you know, the last time he uh, this individual was in Jamaica was when he was four months old. This is further genocised in um, the populism that we see today with Boris Johnson, um, in with some elements of the well i've got to be blunt here the british working class um the um elites in britain uh, well there is this idea that we should uh fence up the border and send f1 back home when you begin to explore what they mean by you know send back home we get into a bit of dangerous territory so sorry for the uh, opening rant everyone um But to answer the question, what is the hostile environment? Well, it's a bit like the phrase Brexit means Brexit. What what does that mean? There are various interpretations. In other words, to make Britain look less attractive um, uh, as a destination for those wishing to migrate to the UK. Yeah, well, so this is really what you described, the policy that Theresa May, that was that was what was known as the, the Windrush scandal, because people who had come over on the on the Windrush from places like uh, Jamaica, for example, um, they were targeted even after they had had citizenship. You know, they, they'd been fully embedded into society, even, even uh, for, for 30, 40 years or, well, 50 years in some cases, and then all of a sudden... Um, they were getting uh, they were getting their immigration status questioned in the 2010s in the tens. Uh, so that yeah. that's what you've just described, isn't it? Is what what came to be known as the Windrush scandal. Yeah, well, the, the hostile environment. What I'm, I'm trying to allude to here is uh, isn't something new. This is something that is worsening as time goes on. But I don't know. If, I suppose if you were to ask someone who was from uh, Ireland how they felt during the uh, 80s, 90s, um, and you know, to some extent even today, uh, perhaps to a lesser extent, I think they would perhaps describe the environment in Britain as being relatively hos- uh, hostile. Uh, you know, again, uh, you know, I was born in uh, the last few days of 1986. Um, I can remember seeing uh, signs, you know, no blacks, no dogs, no Irish. And it, when I was uh, young, didn't really understand what it meant. Sure. And to be fair, you know, there weren't 
as uh, many is. I, I now understand there were on you know various uh, shop fronts and whatever else. But you saw but them just... personally. You saw that in in your history in your lifetime. So what sort of what it, sort of decade was that when you when you last actually saw but, a sign saying saying exactly I can, that? I can, I can tell you exactly where I was actually. It was uh, it was in 1994. It was uh, a few weeks before my brother was born. And it was the week in which Kurt Cobain died. Uh, I think I was around July of 1994. But I remember seeing this. Um, it was outside a. Uh, it was a, in London, um, just off Regent Circus. There was a, a, a superb donut shop. I'm not on commission, everyone, but there was a superb donut shop. And a little bit further down the street was sort of a, I don't know, like a a back alley sort of coffee shop uh with what i assume was some sort of b and b slash hotel something like that um but that's where i saw it and like i say you don't understand these things um perhaps when you uh, oh i didn't really understand what it meant um but there it was i i do uh, you know i remember seeing that as recent as um, that, as recent as the nineties, and I was always had this feeling it was maybe back to the seventies or sixties or something. But when the the nineties felt kind of progressive, but that's when you saw it—the the week that Kurt Cobain died. I think that the yeah, certainly the you know the the nineties can be seen as progressive. But I mean, let's again come back to the um, the argument with, uh, for example, as I say, uh, uh, the Irish. It was only what two or three years ago. Pretty Patel, um, who I think uh, should worry for her life should she ever step foot in Ireland, um, after saying, well, you know, um, the genocide will cut off the food supplies again, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, excuse me, the genocide, the famine, I think she referred to, the, uh, referred to it. Um, and I, I saw, I mean, what sort of a, a country gloats about some of the crimes from the Victorian period? Now, have we truly not learned these lessons? But again, it fits in with the, the narrative here. Hostile environment. It doesn't mean anything. You're not going to find a policy um, paper or an act of parliament headed up with hostile environment. But it is a descriptor for the sort of country um, that the neocons that are currently running Britain. Um, so how they, how they wish to uh, to see Britain in the future. I mean, Here's, here's the real question, though. You can talk about a hostile environment. I think if you were to ask genuinely Priti Patel or Johnson or someone like that, what does Britain look like in 10 years' time? They wouldn't be able to answer. And that's because it's a populist thing. It's very, you know, uh, God forbid there was a, it, there'd be a referendum today on hanging, for example. I, I, I worry that it would pass. Well, that's interesting, but, isn't it? Because Priti Patel said she, she, was, she wanted to bring back the death penalty. So... You know, yes, um, well, you know, which is uh, proven um, by many, in many countries, including our own, uh, not actually to be a deterrent. It's a public spectacle. In other words, it's a bit like PPE in a workplace. You know, um, really, there are other things employees could do, but PPE is the most visible and the cheapest. So there you go. Um, Look, the hostile environment under Blair, um, you know, Brown um, uh, had, had also followed up a policy. Uh, we will seek to do, uh, to deport um, prisoners uh, who were immigrants, for example. I mean, this was the, you know, this is, immigration has been a very toxic uh, debate, um, really going back to, you know, you could go with Austin Chamberlain in the 1900s, you know, do we have a federal empire or do we have an imperial one? And we know which one um, uh, won the day. Um, there is this, in, in some parts of government, there is an idea that uh, there is a ruling class and there's British exceptionalism. You know, there, there's something pure about uh, being British. Um, and there we go. You know that that's that for me is what the, the the hostile environment is. Now, unfortunately, um, the hostile environment has uh, led to Britain suffering. And I know that I've said this on the uh, the program before. 
Uh, some of your listeners might remember me saying it is going to get worse before it gets worse. Um, further to this, you're going to find that uh, other than I think shortages, mass unemployment, underemployment, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, a hostile environment. Uh, I'm sure that one in Britain can agree has worked really, really well. Well, so we've got a situation now um, where the, you know, well, we'll get onto this um, a little bit later on. We're talking about how it's led to shortages as well in the situation. Um, so let's have a look at the what the hostile environment with Pretty Patel seems to be, actually, which is um, which is that there, there were these requirements. When the Boris Johnson government came in uh, after the election of 2019, they were going to bring in an Australian point-style system. I think some of that hasn't quite come to complete fruition because of the of the situation they've been facing as well but it was the australian style point system is about about immigrants migrants coming to a job that is a certain amount per year i think it was it originally as high as 35,000 pounds a year it might have been reduced to 25,000 pounds per year which which excludes a lot of people who would be doing some of the jobs that they're facing shortages of, yeah. of for example and then also a requirement to have on to have on have on them not not just you know no money at all but something like i'm not sure what the exact figure was i was trying to find that i think it was either 1200 pounds or a thousand pounds um already in their bank so a lot of people who are coming to to do certain jobs um are coming because they need to get some money uh, and that's why they're working and so so that also was something that would put a barrier between um britain and some of the jobs that actually we did need to be be getting filled by some of the, some of these people so so um can you sort well, again, of describe uh, that situation? Yeah, so again, uh, you know, context is for King. So um, the uh, victory parades and uh, Big Ben chiming and all of this flag waving and all of this, um, when Britain left the European Union, uh, or as it uh, as is more correct, left the customs union uh, at the beginning of... Um, it feels like uh, January 2020. Feels wasn't like a it? few years ago. It, yes. It, well, it was, know, it was when only... the yeah, 31st of January. It was when the, when the when the, we said this is where it's. And then of course the complete um, um, cut off was, yeah. was one January 2021 when when everyone was still you know thinking about the virus. So you know, the, but they still it, it, it really really does feel like it was uh, quite a bit longer ago. But anyway, uh, yeah. So since the beginning of 2021, so yes, Britain left the European Union. We were still members of the Customs Union. So uh, just to look at the EU. So as a member of the Customs Union, um, not a Customs Union, the European Customs Union or the European Union, uh, both are, uh, are subtly different. There are four fundamental freedoms um, to be a member. So, you know, it's a bit like, uh, I don't know, think about it, think of it in a way as, you know, Sky, you know, or your Sky TV or um, your TV license or something like this, or, you know, water, you know, you pay to be a member of something, but there are also rules of things that you can't do. So, for example, you weren't allowed, if you remember, um, cough, cough, uh, to record programs um you know on a vhs or on a cd give the sky that. example for you which is um if you um you might have the basic package uh, and not have access to sky sports or sky movies now called sky cinema so i'd know all about that um so it's like t yes so um one of the fundamental tiers of membership that uh, applies to to the above was the four fundamental freedoms and You've got freedom of um, movement being one of them. There is, uh, you know, free trade effectively of goods and services uh, and of uh, capital, essentially. So at the beginning of 2021, at the beginning of this year, um, freedom, that those four freedoms came to an end for Britain. Prior to this, though, um, the UK had become a little bit obsessed with Australia, if you recall, in the run up to um, the signing of um, the withdrawal arrangements, etc. You know, I remember Johnson talking about we want an Australian style Brexit, which 
you know, or Australian style deal, which of course Australia not having anything was a euphemism for um, leave with no deal, which essentially is what happened. Um, but then there was this Australian point style and Australian this. So essentially, beginning of 2021, the UK adopted a variation of a point based criteria for uh, immigrants. And this applied to uh, any EU nationals, um, whether there were some of the arrangements, if you're already working in the UK, you had to apply for settled status. But if you hadn't, and perhaps you'd seen a job in the UK and you were living in Germany, for example, or, you know, someone like that, Germany being a high skilled, high wage um, economy, um, you had to fit in to uh, points categories. And there are different points categories, but I'll just talk you through one of them, for example, and this is the skills criteria. So in order to um, come to the UK, any migrant workers must qualify now to have 70 points. So, for example, if you have a job offer, and that job offer is from um, an approved government approved employer and there is a genuine requirement for a skilled job and you can also speak English, then you will have uh, achieved 50 points. So you need to pick up the other 20 from somewhere. If you were paid uh, or the job offer um, is offered at more than 25 thousand six hundred pounds a year then that would give you the other 20 points so in other words you apply and have to pay um, for a visa etc etc in order to migrate to the UK it's worth pointing out that the UK who signed and actually wrote a lot of the international legislation covering uh, refugees um, the, the, this shouldn't apply to but of course we're sending gunboats to uh, return the people who have lost their homes due to British manufactured weaponry um, uh, having flattened their homes in the first place but anyway you can also gain extra points uh, for having qualifications so if you have a PhD um, that's worth 10 points if you have a qualification, I think, again, a PhD in something like maths or the sciences, that would give you uh, 20 points. In other words, that's a special category of point for those who, uh, for those skills that it's deemed the UK doesn't have. And of course, PhD um, uh, holders will, of course, look forward to, um, you know, uh, butchering, uh, uh, butchering uh, pigs or you know, picking fruit and veg. Aha. Yeah. Uh, some jobs, if you're skilled in health or education, might um, give you 20 points as well. Um, but as I say, uh, and I think for health, the requirement, if you're a health worker, is 20, it's, it's £20,480, which is less than the 25600 But again, uh, you need to speak English. Um, speaking English gives you 10 points. Um, now, there you go. Um, applicants then had to start, uh, you know, applying online. They would have to get sponsorship from employers. Um, there were fees for employers as well. It's not a case of, um, oh, we, we're just going to look um, overseas. Employers have to, uh, again, apply, again, have to pay. Um, extra and it's not just oh you've got to have something in your bank as well down the skills route you also are looking for a range of between 600 610 pounds and 1400 pounds um fee to apply um there's also a health charge of 624 pounds per person per family etc um uh, that you have to pay into the NHS just to begin with, for example. Um, and further to this, if you are taking the non-skilled route, 
the amount that you need to have in your bank account is £1,270 per month. So not just, that not just cannot... the, that's, that's just the initial, um, not just an initial amount of, um, before starting work, but that much. You need, yes, in other words, you have to, uh, uh, you, you find in other countries they have wording like this, mustn't be a burden to the state, uh, must have the ability to support themselves. Now, £1,270 a month is what the government deems to be um, the amount that you would need to support yourself. Now, let's be real here, that would exclude anyone from living from London. So this is a, um, things like this are sort of gentrifying cities, you know, um, you go and live where all the migrants live, you know, it, you, you wouldn't be able to afford, uh, I know I used to live in London, but uh, you wouldn't be able to afford anything really w with £1,270. If you wanted to pay for your um, utilities and all of this, you'd need substantially more. In London especially, yes. Okay. So what you have then is, they're just the hurdles for skilled um, and for non-skilled, you need to demonstrate that you have sufficient funding available to support yourself. Now, there are other routes as well. Um, so you can, um, the government backtracked on putting caps on the number of people, uh, a number of students, I should, I should say. Um, there isn't a limit for the number of international students that can come to the UK. Now, the reason I'm mentioning this is the effect. We have had a battle with some universities. I couldn't mention any of them out loud, unfortunately, but if you were to look in the Oxford area, you'd find that there's a few colleges uh, and universities there. Um, and here's the thing. Um, colleges, universities that certainly uh, in my own union, Unite, um, th that we've worked with and we've developed lots of programmes for our uh, reps, members um, to gain access to higher education um, at a com at a discounted rate. Um, those discounts have been removed in favour of international students simply because they know that they can charge the full whack. So whilst I'm saying, you know, OK, there's no um, uh, there isn't a cap anymore. Uh, there isn't a cap, sorry, for, for study. Um, this again is up the price of our own domestic access to education where universities are favoring international students who they can charge you know realistically whatever they want um now it's not as straightforward if you want to apply for a study visa you you need to do so uh, within six months of uh obtaining your course and there is a graduate uh, visa that says if you complete your degree and how kind the UK will allow you to stay for two years before you've guessed it hostile environment kicks in and off you go. Um, there's a fast track scheme uh, that's in place for doctors, nurses. Um, I think some form of uh, care is also on that list. Um, I would need to check it's uh, been a, a good few months since last looked, but um, Anyway, um, if you're eligible, you know, let's say you're a healthcare professional, uh, you're eligible to uh, fit the fast track scheme, then again, it's not really um, as generous as it sounds. You just pay a slightly reduced fee somewhere towards the £600 um, um, for your visa. Um, However, very generously, because you know you're working in health, uh, perhaps you will be exempt from paying the immigration health charge. But again, you still have to meet the salary thresholds, and I don't know too many nurses uh, who earn um, twenty uh, uh, odd grand. Um, so again, we've got. Um, yeah, and I certainly don't know many care workers um, who would meet the income requirements either. 
Plus, of course, we're just talking about one person. What about a family? Um, should they wish to, to travel? So in a nutshell, you know, that's the. You know, that is the new point system and you might be sat there thinking, oh, well, this is a very good, a good idea. You know, it's clear. Uh, uh, sorry, try not to shuffle. Um, you know, but it's, um, you know, there's a point system. It means that we've finally got control of migration. Well, yeah, but here's the thing. When we were members of the EU, we could have had this point system. Uh, and we could have had this point system applying for those countries outside of the EU. Um, as we've seen with COVID, the notion of controlling borders hasn't been a problem for any EU member state. A lot of this, um, you, you know, my view on the whole Brexit referendum is the question was poor and both sides were lied to. But the reality of the situation is we could have controlled um, migration um we either chose not to or allowed this uh, this great lie to to perpetuate itself so we're going to be suffering now um you say that we actually are suffering quite a shortage of of people who were who, who did certain jobs so it just shows that, that that they're not easily filled from within britain so obviously the most what seems to be the most famous thing at the moment is the shortage of hgv drivers but also it is sad, and it's, I think it's just anecdotal so far that there was a situation where um, where many jobs were there, there were hundreds or thousands of applicants in some cases, and um, you know, such as to work in coffee shops and so on. Um, and now, and now there are many jobs actually where it's reversed; it's reversed around so that so that there aren't they can't find people to fill them. So, what do you think? Um, what do you think is the root cause of, of the current HGV driver shortage, which is they're said to be short by thousands of drivers it's hard to get the exact figure but there's a i think it was something like there needs to be about two hundred and forty thousand drivers or something and uh they're, they're short by several quite a few thousand which was we're, we're probably going to end up by um but certainly this end of december january with perhaps anywhere in the region of 750 to one and a half million uh 750,000 to one and a half million um uh short uh short in terms of uh logistics infrastructure is perhaps more what we're talking about rather than just drivers but again this isn't something new um the driver shortage has uh, firstly been a result of chronic uh low wages and poor treatment from the various logistics companies uh, who have, frankly have treated their members, uh, excuse me, their employees, our members uh, in Unite uh, absolutely appallingly. Um, low pay, uh, low wages, um, you know, people like Hilary DeVay, who runs Palex, who doesn't believe that uh, trade unions should be involved in her, in her company, citing that it's a low profit um, environment. Well, the thing is, there's no doubting that logistics is, um, you know, there are a lot of companies and they do compete, but there's no need to treat your staff. And this isn't uh, Hillary DeVay, by the way, I'm just, that was just a quote, but for the logistics companies treating their staff by and large um, to the following, you know, you're a driver uh, in 20, uh, 2012, let's say, um, your diet is poor. Uh, what's on offer at some of the truck, uh, truck stops isn't particularly great. You might have to stop in your own cabin. If you are in, um, uh, fortunate enough to be put up overnight, for example, you're on a long haul. Uh, in the UK, you're in facilities that are uh, appalling. Uh, the number of drivers who uh, have said to me, not just, you know, since... Uh, uh, the, you know, 2020, 20, 2021. Uh, but ever since I've been teaching uh, uh, reps uh, and members, you know, oh, I take a camp stove with me. It's the only way I can get some decent food and I'm away from my family and I don't get paid enough and there's restrictions and there's etc. etc. So this has been a long time coming. Um, and it turns out that Predominantly, a large number of 
people who have occupied those positions are from those uh, countries that, um, you know, Eastern Europe, for example, not just exclusive of that, but from, from uh, people who would put up with the poor pay, uh, etc. Um, you know, because it was a job. Um, and uh, that's a broad statement, and I'm not sure I agree with most of it, but by and large, you know, there are, there are groups of workers uh, who uh, would satisfy and were, were satisfied with uh, with the conditions I've just outlined. It turns out driving vans around and telling people who um, were once welcome into Britain uh, through our membership of the EU to, you know, F off back home <laughs> uh, wasn't the best idea. Because they did actually go. A lot, a lot, are, a lot have gone. Lots have gone in 2021. And um, why? Well, no, uh, actually. Before that um, as well. This is this has been. I mean, what, what's look at it in a different way. Since we've, you know, turned up the um, um, uh, the gas on this so-called hostile environment, people have started to leave. Britain has experienced a skilled drain and is mo most likely going to experience a so-called brain drain uh, in the coming uh, year or two, whereby people who, again, have settled, you know, it could be for 20, you know, 30 years, who are being told, you know, you, you prove you have a right to work here or you go back home. And these are people from Germany, Spain, France, you know, um, you know people who've been working, contributing, paying taxes in Britain, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, are now very seriously considering uh, leaving. Uh, just yesterday, actually, ahead of this uh, interview, I asked uh, um, a uh, German um, friend of mine um, who had married a, a British national um, uh, where they were bringing up their kids. Uh, there was some debate as to whether to do this in the UK or not. And the conclusion is we wouldn't go back to the UK um we've seen the way that they treat anyone who just looks or even sounds remotely non-white and i thought hey, there's more to it than just this so i sort of pressed a little further and they said look look um it, i'm a uh, driver i didn't uh know he that he'd gone into you know uh, driving or anything like that and said no we, we've got a uh, you know decent pay yes we work long hours um, you know, that's part and parcel of the, the, the job, but I don't have to put up with the sort of conditions uh, in Britain. Um, it's not just the employer, of course, it's then the, the rest of it. It's the being away from family, uh, not just away from family, but you've got, um, you know, it, well, have a good look for, for anyone who's listening just at service stations and compare them continental Europe versus Britain. I can name you. The, uh, the nicest service station, T-Bay in Cumbria, uh, perhaps the one in Gloucester that they've just opened as well. Well, there you go. The, the rest of them, are, I wouldn't recommend stopping. High petrol prices, get that anywhere. But the conditions aren't really designed to make you want to stay. There's a gambling area and um, fast food, that's it. On the continent, you know, you can have some of the best meals uh, at some of the service stations oh, yeah. or train stations. Oh yeah, well, I've noticed there um, how good the T-Bay service is, one because it's next to um, West Moreland. It's next to it's in the Lake District on the M6, and you've got you've got the uh, you're looking over a sort of lake with ducks and uh, nice nice moorland. But I suppose <laughs> the, the rest of them, yeah, um, you've got the um, the shops, you've got the chain shops. Uh, high petrol prices or diesel prices on all of them and uh well truckers will complain that you know that that they charge far, far too much to, to stop somewhere and there's no there's no facilities yeah. to to actually stop and, and most uh council areas are trying to stop trucks uh stopping whereas in france uh they're, they're very much welcome even locals even bringing them food and things like that um, well again i've had um you know um when I was speaking to this uh, German national um, who's had a career change, becoming a driver, um, you know, it, it just ties in so much with what I've heard uh, reps discuss, which is, you know, if we, we stop somewhere, if we stop at the services, 
you know, where were the showers? Uh, where were the clean showers? Um, you know, uh, clean toilets, facilities, and what have you? Um, you know, there, there's lots of um, uh, lots of problems, and there's a huge shortage. You know, we've got a high unemployment rate um, in Britain, officially four and a half percent. I think unofficially a little higher in some sectors of the economy, whereas in 18 sectors of the economy, there's um, chronic um, uh, shortages, uh, not just of people doing uh, uh, the logistics side of things, but also, uh, you know, you're looking hospitality, you're looking hotels. Again, another um, sector that have treated their staff oh so well over the past uh, 10 years, who the hostile environment is something that we see uh, in the trade union movement, you know, we're met with open hostility by employers. We're not welcome with, well, actually, you've got, a, uh, you should be around the table, you you know, you're part and parcel of the workplace. And they're now seeing that people who were putting up with, uh, you know, lower uh, uh, paid work. So th these shortages um, of, uh, of labour um, to undertake the basics. It turns out that actually most jobs are, you know, essential jobs. And it's not the fact that there's a shortage of petrol or fuel. You know, there might be of uh, gas supplies, I have to say. But for petrol, it's the fact that it can't be delivered. So it relates directly to the HGGV drive. I was going to inter a shortage. I was going to interject that I've seen the motorway services charging a fiver to have a shower. I might have thought that was actually kind of um, um, even even if, even as someone on relatively low income thought, oh, you can actually get a shower here if you pay a fiver. But I was just thinking now, in, in the case of um, you know delivery drivers needing needing to do that and needing somewhere to stop, um, being charged a fiver there would be part of the the sort of mobile hostile environment you were describing right. earlier it, 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 it's a hygiene tax on uh, on drivers is the way to look at it um you know at the end at the end of the day service stations are pretty expensive um you know the, the least that they could do is uh, offer you know decent facilities for uh for drivers or perhaps the employer should be paying for them you know i know some do but either way so you know, the shortage of HGV drivers, if we focus on that, has been a long time coming. You know, chronic low pay, hostile environment for the trade union movement, um, and, you know, dare I say Amazon, um, for example, um, attacking, you know, workers' rights, et cetera, very poor conditions, um, keep being reported for those workers in Amazon, for example, the logistics and infrastructure in Britain um, is essentially crippled. And unfortunately, I really wish I could say to you, to everyone, oh, it, it is going to get better. It will do eventually. You know, I suppose the, the idea of markets, which have currently failed, um, the supply chain disruption that we're facing is going to get worse over the next year or two. Um, and the government, um, which uh, just frankly has been a, a joke. Well, it's not a joke because it's not funny. Um, oh, we'll offer a temporary three month, um, you know, sort of visa waiver, you know, so you can all get out of the country for Christmas. Uh, well, the U turned on this and said, oh, no, no, we'll extend it. It'll be six months. All oh, right. So at Easter now, <laughs> you get to leave the country. We, we have. We have come to rely upon um, workers from other countries, whether it was Windrush, um, you know, workers in the NHS. Um, you know, being an island, uh, we can't shut ourselves off from the rest of the world. Um, it's never worked before, and it won't work now. Okay, what an interesting question uh, is is that um, is that it used to be that before before going into the European economic area, the community. Um, um, some some would say you know we didn't have that in the 1960s or the early 70s before joining. Why why can't we make it work again? No, we, we've done this. Yeah, but then before. again, then again, bananas weren't exactly commonplace back then either, and the economy's changed. Yes, Our sir. needs have changed rapidly. Um, you know, we we don't have you know outbreaks of uh, 
um, polio and uh, rubella and all of that either, do we? No, so it's um, a, so, well, I was going to make one point before you say yeah, this, um, which was you mentioned Amazon as well. That that Jeff Bezos was amongst a group of people who were, or you know, sort of billionaires, I guess they they were, along with Elon Musk, and who were, were exploring near space and and William Shatner. So that so whilst you say about those conditions that Amazon delivery drivers face, that that's the sort of money they've got at the top of the company. Well, if I, if Bezos had given um, his staff last year at the outbreak in March all of his staff a £43,000 pay rise, he would still be in the region of $300 million, note the difference in currency there, well off. Um, so, yeah, when it comes to, uh, to Bezos, um, again, <laughs> we're dealing here and, uh, you know, it, it's one of these I've, I've often said, you know, give me a megaphone loud enough um, to get across particular messages to Britain. We, we've got a situation. If you genuinely believe that um, this isn't government incompetence, employer incompetence, when it comes to um, the situation we find ourselves in today, you know, where for most, you know, Christmas is already cancelled. If you if you genuinely believe that this is due to the pandemic, um, then I wish you well. Um, I, I can't help you. Um, you. You're obviously getting a lot of your news from the BBC or Facebook. The reality of the situation is this. There is and has been a shortage of drivers for some time. Um, Britain has um, you know, historically uh, been a place that is welcomed uh, people, uh, <laughs> at least to work, uh, nothing else. Um, and we've come to rely upon our integration with, within Europe. Um, that's the reality of the situation. Um, if you think that these shortages uh, of uh, drive power, uh, drive power, that's an one, of drivers um, and um, personnel, et cetera, uh, is because of COVID, then I invite you to travel to France, Germany, Spain, Italy, um, the Czech Republic, or Czechia, um, Scandinavia, go to any country, Australia even, and you'll find, well, petrol supplies are in, you know, um, uh, <laughs> petrol supplies are fine. There's no huge uh, increase in prices in petrol, no, they are increasing slightly. You will find yourself being able to top up with, well, uh, as I did uh, earlier on, Without any uh, queue, the supermarket shelves aren't empty. There's a variety of food out there. Um, and yeah, no issue. So it's funny how COVID seems to have only affected Britain. The reality of this is an economic one. Uh, and it really is as straightforward as this. Um, we have voted for um and we have to in many ways accept this uh we have voted for the biggest supply chain disruption um since on the second world war i would i would suggest um in many ways it's worse because those things that we've imported from our neighbors i mean britain you know great britain as an island is what, 21 miles, 20 odd miles away from the continent of Europe. We built a, we, we built a tunnel to connect ourselves. Uh, we have uh, regular um, ferries and all of this were. Now, firstly, the issue was the leaving the customs union meant that um, we have lots of checks on goods coming into the UK as well as import tariffs. And the delays of getting fresh fruit and vegetables, for example, uh, from the continent has meant that by the time it gets to the supermarkets, they're spoiling. Um, we've got high tariffs on other items that we've imported, which Unfortunately, the supermarkets and, you know, uh, I was reading something earlier on about uh, 
uh, there being some issues now with sofas, perhaps the DFS sale is going to eventually come to an end. But they're going to pass over those um, th those increased costs to um, uh, to average folk, which means inflation increases. Um, and Britain is a low wage, um, high tax um, system that doesn't give people any real net to fall on should they find themselves out of work. The welfare system is well, a disgrace. To, that's bringing me on um, to something that's worth mentioning, uh, which is that the, the universal credit uplift of £20 a week uh, on top of what was 74 I'm sure when they brought it in, it might have been March or April 2020, they've just um, they've just brought, dropped that down, back down to 74 again in October yes. 2021 so that so that is coming at a time of these rising prices and uh, you know the, these effects as well isn't it uh, coming from a minister who wants to screech down karaoke whilst claiming over 200 grand's worth of expenses yeah um yes and I'm referring directly to uh Therese uh, Coffee there um who's the uh, uh minister uh in charge of uh, um welfare dwp and all of this so it's fine for her to claim absolutely everything um clearly not sinking lessons um from the taxpayer but the 20 pound or 80 pounds um uh uplift in the month is now being offset by our second major problem which isn't just petrol or hgv drivers or anything like that We've now got an increase um, as a result of all of uh, the above in the cost of energy. You know, uh, what's an extra 13 quid a month? Um, well, that was August. We're looking at an extra 30 pounds a month potentially by December. Um, maybe uh, a 30 uh, to 38 percent increase in overall energy costs. You know, we're approaching nearly increase your energy bills by uh, you know, uh, by 50%. Um, and what that does is pushes people who, you know, might have thought themselves at one point is having a decent um, rate of pay further into difficulty. And for those people who are on uh, welfare entitlements, disability welfare entitlements, whatever, into abject poverty. Mm -hmm. Well, how do I mean? Wh wh how how do we uh, resolve this? And instead, um, it, it's very difficult not to get very frustrated with this. And as all of this is going on, we find that the Prime Minister Boris Johnson um, has gone off uh, on holiday um, with people who have been avoiding paying tax. Now I say this: there's plenty of money um, flowing around. But most of it's being siphoned off into tax havens. You only need to look at the Pandora Papers and Panama Papers. I mean, how much more uh, do we have to find out about, uh, you know, the likes of Tony Blair, uh, Johnson, various um, um, uh, political uh, figures and others, uh, them avoiding tax. Meanwhile, uh, you know, the British working class with increased energy prices, food prices, et cetera, et cetera, are being taxed for government incompetence. And I just want to say one other thing. It's not just the government. Employers for far too long have very simply uh, been de-skilling their workforce, either through um, systems such as lean, continuous improvement, whatever you want to call it, getting workers to follow a script what we call tailorism to follow a script and uh, one stop shop and all of this de-skilling workforces it applies just as much to um, drivers as it as it does to other things so i don't just hold government um, uh, to account for all of this but i also hold um, some of those uh, services that we all rely upon energy utilities road transport etc where has the increase in skills been? And for British gas and the energy suppliers, a simple question. You've been making billions each year. Where is it?
Mm, well, literally, where is it? Yeah. Um, you were talking, well, Panama was a bit of a clue, wasn't it? And the Panama Papers in some cases. So, um, so I was going to ask also is why, why can't, um, in Britain, uh, they manage to fill job vacancies uh, that have been unfilled? Because of what, been, what, the, what maybe the right wing have been saying is that, is that so-called natives should be able to fill them. But they've not actually been able to, not really been seeing that happening. So why does, why, if there is an exodus... Um, you know, due to due to these reasons, why why can't they just be filled with with, with who's available locally? Well, it, it's not as easy. I mean, right where we've got you know, I mentioned eighteen sectors. It's not just in road transportation, but we've got things like uh, chronic shortages in uh, of nurses and doctors. Uh, we've got shortages in. Um, well, that takes a lot of training, doesn't it? Obviously, uh, but in, in some of the casual uh, examples, you know, um, there's, well, there's again, a lot of in, 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 in yeah. retail. Um, I mean, for example, we've got a huge uh, situation with um, uh, livestock at the moment. So, the, I'm just trying to pick some themes amongst them. You you can't just go and apply to be a, a doctor tomorrow. Um, because the first question you'll be asked is, and whether your qualifications, training, and experience. It takes someone in the region of 15 years uh, to complete um, training for, um, I don't know, a consultant, let's say, in a, uh, a, and I mean an actual consultant, not a management uh, critter, uh, it within a hospital, for example, you know, at least a decade, you know, for your uh other doctors gps etc you know this ongoing training and all of that same with nurses uh, a short period for some sort uh, for some nurses but you can't just bring people online uh, the same applies uh, for an example in the police forces um with lorry drivers where you need to have um uh, particular not just qualifications theory and practical examinations too so it's not just as straightforward is um oh i know what we'll do is uh we'll you know bring people online um and before uh, people say this and i'm just going to do a shout out really to uh, some reps that i was with uh, from wales uh, not last week the week before um before anyone says we'll bring the army in let me just say this where we've got shortages in ambulance services for example uh, the army uh, are not permitted to blue light in emergencies if they're doubling up as ambulance drivers as they are in Wales. And that's having negative consequences uh, on patients. They also, um, you know, or will bring the army in to deliver fuel. They don't understand the processes and procedures that are required from oil terminals, for example, going into uh, petrol stations and the various requirements there. Uh, that are designed to protect uh, people from mistakes uh, or serious injuries, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not just as simple as, oh, we'll bring people in. You you take the civil aviation sector, where, um, you know, there's, it's been crippled by COVID, yes, um, and whereby there are requirements to train people up for issues of national security in airports, security staff, et cetera, et cetera. This isn't, you know, it, it, it's not a case of, oh, well, why don't people just become a, um, know, a pig farmer or become a, well, again, you need experience with it. Um, couple this up with shortages in things like CO2. No, you couldn't make it up. The thing that's killing the planet and us, uh, CO2, is we've got shortages for humane um, uh, butching and uh, fertilising. You know, we need nitrates also to intensively farm as we do. These are not things that can just be clicked into existence. That's why we've got and this is really the nub of why I'm saying this situation is not going to uh, get easier in in the short term. You know, this is going to be with us. This is going to hurt, in other words. And this isn't project fair or anything like that, but it is the reality. 
Yeah, we, we're going to find we're going to find um, you know hundreds of thousands of pigs being called because they can't be butched. You know, they can't be butchered in a um, in a way that uh, you know you could sell the produce of the meat. But what happens next year then? Well, next year there'll be a shortage of pork, which increases the price of the pork. We can't import it, you see, because well, we've already discussed that. Yeah. So really, so you're talking about, um, but the, but the, but the jobs that require sort of no, no sort of you know built up skills, and, and and almost anybody could do it. They also say they can't really fill them. So such as um, you know, just picking on fields, for example. Uh, they say they can't find people to do that anymore. I suppose, to put it bluntly, a lot of people came to, from Europe to do it, and now they don't. So oh, it's um, what, a seasonal job. And it's a seasonal it's, it's job not anyway. Just, yes. You know, again, it's not, it's not just an, an issue for. Um, you know, can we get some people from you know France or you know, the Lithuania or wherever to come and do it? It's seasonal, um, and we in Britain have a outlook that says, "Well, one adult education, or did you fail?" We're a bit snobbish about it. And when it comes to seasonal jobs, I mean, if you're looking at getting, I don't know, uh, a rental agreement, uh, how will that seasonal job work out for you? Oh, you mean you're going to be unemployed uh, potentially afterwards? Oh, reject. Well, so there yes, are lots yeah. of reasons yeah. why it is that people won't um, uh, or can't uh, do the jobs. And again, if you're if you're sat there thinking, well, there's not been any change to my skills. You know, I work in an office, or I do all of that. Well, do you just think about when you first started? And uh, did you know how to use a printer, fax machine, if you have them? Um, you know, Word. How many of you? How many people? You know, face techno stress um, with the introduction of I don't know Windows 10 into their workplace. What about the interpersonal skills required to do your job? You know, it could be complaint handling skills. It could be managerial skills. You don't just start off with uh, skills. They require a mixture of education, ongoing uh, job training and skills and sometimes it means employers need to pay for it um in order to you know retain work uh, uh workers um and it requires time you know there there was the essential ingredients where we've got shortages predominantly they're the places that we have we we, we have been very lucky that people from other countries have wanted to come and work in britain and instead of saying, OK, referendum done, this is what's going to happen. But let's try and attract people, uh, you know, to remain, um, pardon the pun. Uh, let's try and uh, attract people to, with all of uh, this, you know, to come uh, help us. And let's make it not a hostile, but a friendly environment. We've shot ourselves in one foot by massive economic disruption and in another now by telling everyone to go home. Why would anyone from Germany want to come to the UK um, given the way that we've treated uh, uh, people who weren't from Britain? Well, many of you are saying that they wouldn't actually and that's where the situation is. So, And you've said what these, the uh, examples of what's going to happen as a result of these uh, the shortage as well, just simply that prices are going to go up. Um, well, it's, it, yes, it's not just that. Uh, I, I just want to mention as well, in terms of visas and all of this, if one country that Britain has a, uh, the UK has a land border with, which is Ireland, I should just point out that the common travel agreement is still in effect, so it doesn't apply to people from Ireland. But again, why would you wish to, uh, to come to Britain for that? It's not just increase in prices. Um, we've actually deflated the welfare uh, entitlements that people receive at a time when everything else is going up. We've given a poor pay rise to nurses, which have been out costed by national insurance contribution increases. Uh, at the same time, the rich are hovering, you know, uh, money over in uh, other countries to avoid tax. Um, we've got national insurance increasing for what? An increasing NHS sell off. Uh, more taxes higher inflation and an economy that in many regards um, cannot afford to pay its uh, workforce 
Yeah, this is going to be horrendous in my view. I think it already is. Um, you know, and, and it, it, just to make things a little worse, because Britain has uh, engaged with the European Union by now reneging on international law, or beginning to, a country that used to be renowned as being the, you know, the country that used to write a lot of international law, not break it, is not trusted by other countries. And so I can uh, say to you, the EU are looking at trying to attract British drivers um, over, and I would expect an announcement shortly of five-year visas alongside um, training and, and uh, free courses in learning other languages um, for those drivers um, if they want to come and uh, settle in the EU. And I would suggest that there'll be more uptake with that, which will compound the issue with Britain. But I, I will just say this. Now, Britain is the one that left the European Union and we could have remained friends Instead, the way that we've uh, been remaining on deals and, you know, oh, it's the French and all of this in uh, in such a pathetic, pure old way. Um, yeah, we've created a hostile environment also, but in international relations at a time where we're breaking international law and want to sign trade deals with other countries. Incredible. So I'll just um, sort of end with this one. I'm not sure if you'll know, but how did Pretty Patel get to the, to the position she was she's now in? Do you know anything about that? She, she was working as um, she was actually working for a for a for a tobacco company firm, you know, wasn't she? Um, and so how do you get from doing something like that? So it's kind of like she was promoting smoking. That's obviously uh, how do you get from that to being in you know right in the cabinet of UK government? Oh, uh, well, I think the, the way you get into the uh, current government is by having lots of uh, money and uh, at the same outlook. I mean, it's surprising, really. Uh, it's not unheard of. But I think um, her family came from Uganda originally. I think fleeing um, and Gidi Amin uh, and all of this. And so it's somewhat perverse that she adopts policies uh, that I think Gidi Amin would have been pretty proud of. Um, Strange. Um, I honestly don't know too much about uh, uh, Patel's uh, employment background. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if she was selling children's tears to the devil, uh, to be quite honest with you. Uh, but uh, yes, there, uh, uh, there we go. Uh, I'm not too sure. Uh, she certainly adopted this. I've got to become very far right wing in terms of things like immigration and detention and wanting to bring back hanging and God knows what else. Um, so she can better fit in within the Tory ranks. But I do wonder whether she actually gets home at night and uh, has any problems sleeping. And what's sad is I think she sleeps just fine. And when 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 she when you get people like her, you know, who will say about you know with a tough sort of talk about we 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 favour bringing in the death penalty. Uh, you often see a government like even like Boris Johnson's where it doesn't actually happen. Is there any, is there actually any chance of that? Of you know of them trying to propose that and bring it? I know I know that you know some some legislation like the police courts and sentencing bill, which could send people who are merely protesting if they're deemed to be caused a nuisance. It could even be custodial. So some fairly extreme things that might be going through. But you know what what chances have they of actually doing some of the things that they talk about like that? I mean. Um, well, bearing in mind what she's after is immunity from prosecution for, well, anything that goes wrong um, as a result of her, whether it's to do with COVID or deaths, really, uh, you know, from sending gunboats in uh, to various places or whatever, which is a very fascistic thing to do. If you want to look at immunity from prosecution, I can name a few countries in history that have done that. Um, do I think the you know is there any chance that um, these things could come into power? Well, unfortunately, yes, there is. Um, the British public uh, have very clearly, you know, either been not misdirected, um, but certainly um, have had decades of um, being bombarded with, you know, uh, immigration's this great problem 
you know, irrespective of evidence showing the, the immigrants bringing more to this country uh, than they ever take, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's a populist government. If they get a whiff that people want it, oh, they'll run on it. Have a look at the BBC, you know, not BBC as an institution, but look at BBC News. Uh, has any of what we've discussed found itself uh, on their headline? Or just generally discussed? I suppose you would have to. Where, where, where's the critical um, analysis? Where is the, uh, you know, critical thoughts, uh, hard questions to the government? I mean, if anyone can just point out a handful. I mean, that would be really useful. It's but supposed to be I'm things like to question, question time and things like that in the Today programme are supposed to, you know, examples of where there's supposed to be some sort of analysis as well. Or, or, or um, you know, politic, daily politics or this week. But, well, uh, it's the fact that the government uh, refuses to send particular people to answer questions. I mean, governments of any ilk uh, should really be up to scrutiny. That's democracy. That's the way in which that we've we've agreed, at least for uh, for some time. Um, we we have. Yet, you know, where where have we? Uh, you know, where where do we find ourselves? Um, a BBC that won't criticise uh, government, or um, they won't mention the word Brexit when it comes to supply chain disruption. Um, they don't criticise the Prime Minister for running off on a holiday with, uh, uh, you know, some uh, magnates uh, involved in uh, tax evasion. Um, no, instead, they refer to him as Boris. Well, the more we keep referring to Boris Johnson as Boris, um, the more he believes that he's exceptional. And unfortunately, he isn't going anywhere quickly. Well, he didn't. Um, so... He didn't actually um, appear, did he, on many election debates and things on you know the BBC? But also, he you know, said so we go back to the election. He threat, he threat, but he has actually threatened the, the BBC and Channel Four, for example, Channel um, Channel Four that they're going to look at their license um, and whether whether it can be sold off. And the BBC has a, a renewal in twenty twenty seven for the for the settlement of the license fee. So the, they might even still be worried about you know not towing the line. Well, I, I would expect an election, um, I reckon, before June of next year. Um, and the Tories will get another majority. Um, but what they won't go to the country with is uh, uh, any uh, suggestion of tax increases. But that's coming. Well, it is so anyway I, coming, I, isn't it? I, I expect there to be another election. And let's face it, the opposition's incomplete. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, yeah. Does anyone know uh, who Keir Starmer is? Well, um, or, or, or what he said last week, or you know, ever? Well, I've known that some of the things are, are maybe contradictory to things you might hear someone in opposition say. I suppose. I agree with the government. It's the only thing I've heard him say. So, but, so just before we, we'll we'll kind of wrap this up now. But why? Why would they bother with an election before they had to? Uh, you know, such as it's supposed to be 2024, isn't it? What? When are you saying next year? I mean, that obviously <laughs> it guarantees them more years of power winning it, just like in 19. But but was still well, why? It, it, it shuts off any rebellion. Firstly, uh, in the Tory ranks, if those Tory MPs elected in the north, um, uh, you know, it reinforces a mandate and also enables the government to put forward. Well, as I've said, more cuts. More tax increases. You don't want to do that and then call an election. No, that would be daft. And right now is the prime opportunity to do so. I think his his reshuffle recently was a gamble for a general election. Um, and let's face it, the opposition are nowhere to be seen. So why do you think this? Um... I mean, you know, why do you think Keir Starmer is so ineffective as um as an opposition leader and not proposing, you know, opposing ideas? I know he's I know he's more centrist than Jeremy Corbyn, but a lot of people are disappointed about about what he seems to stand for. 
He doesn't have any understanding of the struggles that the working class go through. Um, you know, he's a barrister um, and he's more obsessed with the arguments of the 1990s in the Labour Party and attacking the, his own party. I mean, let's face it, here's what he's done. He lied to members of the Labour Party. He uh, not only that, but has declared war, you know, more than halving the Labour Party's uh, uh, membership base. Um, so those people who used to, you know, go around door knocking and canvassing and all of this aren't there this time. Um, he's more he's more obsessed with um, the right wing of the Labour Party who basically want to make it the case that um, we will never have a socialist government in Britain ever again. They seem very determined, didn't they? And, and now they're acting by actually purging people who were, you know, perhaps aligned with Corbyn within the party, like Ken, like Ken Loach, the the filmmaker who brought us I, Daniel Blake, and sorry we missed you. And obviously, um, again, you, you'll have heard of um, um, this one from the sixties as well. Um, oh, well, oh yeah, I've forgotten the name. Of it. I've forgotten the name of that. <laughs> The one about the housing the situation in the 60s, which was good. Uh... Oh, the spit one is the spirit of 45, um, which is uh, superb. But again, you know, uh, we, we, we've got this, uh, uh, this situation whereby uh, how perverse the, the idea, whatever people think of Jeremy Corbyn, you know, uh, free broadband would have been quite useful when a lot of us had to work from home. Uh, the notion of uh, publicly owned utilities would be quite useful during an energy crisis. You know, th th there are certain things that are very popular with the British public that have been totally dismantled by Starmer's Labour Party. Kathy come home, um, it was called. There you go. So, yes. Yeah, from 1966. So, yes, yeah, so people like him um, and, and, and people find themselves ejected from the Labour Party. They're just ordinary members as well for making socialist statements or things. that. So it's become a different party, hasn't it? And therefore one that, I mean, would it be fair to say it's more towards the Liberal Democrats? Are we just looking for where it's gone in the scale or, would you, or, would you, or is it no, something, I, or something I, else? I mean, look, the, the Liberal Democrats will always prop up a, a Conservative government. Uh, history tells us that. And before we even go into the Lib Lab Pact, look what happened in the end. Yes, the one um, in 15, yes, because they were 20%. So just for your, for your short history. But, but uh, no, I, I would actually suggest that the Labour Party is centre-right. If you look at uh, the comments from shadow ministers on, on the issue of immigration, um, they are, well, close your eyes and you can hear David Cameron saying them. Um, when you look at the position on welfare, um, again, it's not a supportive one for those who are on welfare entitlements. You know, um, they want to have a hostile environment for those who are on welfare. Ed Miliband um, was the same, actually, because there were statements like, you know, we're going to get Britain working in his administration that preceded, that lost the 2015 election, but preceded where Jeremy Corbyn was, um, was elected in as the party leader. Yeah, exactly. Um, indeed. And, you know, there we, there we go. Yeah. Um, now, the reality of the situation is, if there is a general election, I wonder if Keir Starmer will be leading it. He is more unpopular than Jeremy Corbyn was at the same time during um, um, uh, where, where Corbyn is, you know, uh, was, sorry, you know, like 18 months, two years in. He's got net approval ratings of minus 44. Uh, at a time where the government is, um, well, unfortunately, because Starmer has agreed so much with the government, he now can't disagree with uh, the damning report on the uh, um, government's handling of COVID. You know, there's, what, 150,000 people, 130,000 officially, uh, perhaps more who've uh, died because of this uh, pandemic, that... Well, you, you, you know, you, you, t you tell me, uh, when did we have an opposition? No, what we heard was, uh, now is not a time to play party politics. Well, I'll tell you, in a crisis, that's exactly the time you play. You hold everyone up uh, for scrutiny. Um, that's what you do. Um, you know, it's not a political move. You, know, that it, 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 you have to have a functioning opposition. So, um, John, you know... Johnson has neither. 
so obviously um, Jeremy Corbyn was you know was a socialist more to the more to the left and some of the ideas that were taken up by the the Tories as as, as necessities anyway to to get through the pandemic but then you've got that and you know there was infighting they stopped him become you know getting anywhere within the party they actually the you know the ones who were more towards the right stopped him getting anywhere and then and then Keir Starmer's also unpopular um, um, so that means that there's no, there doesn't seem to be even a happy medium between the two for them. Uh, they can't, they can't get anywhere with Jeremy Corbyn, and they can't get anywhere with Keir Starmer. So, where can they go? Uh, well, unfortunately, um, you know, we've, there's real, real changes. Um, I mean, for for anyone looking at the Labour Party, what they will see is a party that. At a time where they could have been offering an alternative vision, they decided to turn on their own. Uh, and with backing from all, well, all the countries, uh, backing from you know various um, uh, large donors and what have you, uh, also alienating the trade union movement and all of this, uh, at a time where Britain desperately needed a opposition. Uh, and whatever anyone's thoughts on Corbyn, again, I repeat, um, you cannot possibly argue that there wasn't a clear difference between uh, the Tories and um, Labour under Corbyn. Well, that's where we're going to we're going to wrap up on, all, on everything that we've talked about there, which is. You know, how do we come to have an HGV driver shortage? It, it, it predates Brexit by a long way. Um, in actual fact, you know, it's, it's kind of been a slow build of those sorts of conditions that, that haven't been accommodating. Uh, and also, you know, what, what's, what's leading to the knock-on effects of the petrol shortage is down to that as well. Obviously, it's delivery, not the stuff itself um, that's been short. And obviously, the whole situation with, with worker shortage um, can maybe does partly relate to, to, to Brexit as well. But it's not just that in the picture and and everything else that we have talked about just just around just around what what's been going on so thanks very much uh, james martin that was the insights of jay martin on our world Society and the jay martin interview